This video was supported by these lovely people. Thank you all so much, my darlings. So, Loch Henry. It's not a real place, obviously, and the episode begins with these marvellous shots of the Scottish countryside. In fact, there are many shots of Scottish locks and villages strewn throughout, as a means of replicating the way Netflix lulls people into watching an entire crime documentary series. It's an episode about the latest trends in documentary filmmaking that lead to explosively popular shows like Making a Murderer. It jabs at the hypnotic ways in which these true stories are told and how they might not be the most ethical choice for our society. Either that, or this episode was just a giant plug for Enterprise Rent-A-Car. The other issue the episode raises is that of dark tourism. Those families of victims living near to where crimes took place probably don't want to see the glorification of murderers. It's one of those grey subjects of discussion that tries to ask whether all that tourist revenue is worth it or not. Let's get a load of this please in our 4K f***ing flat screens and they will be crawling all over us like flies on dog sh All of this and more will be explored in this video and you better have hit the subscribe button if you haven't already so you don't miss a future Black Mirror Season 6 analysis. So did you grow up in America or are you originally from... Jesus, Mum. US born and bred? <sighs> I'm not sure if this is universal around the world generally, but I can definitely say that what Davis and Pia experience here is a very real thing in the UK. When you've lived in a city and you go back to your quiet little hometown to visit the family, you get reminded of the ugly garbage you left behind. Old school attitudes and the cringy racism and or homophobia that gets passed down generation to generation. We see this latter point exemplified through Davis's childhood friend Stuart. Having a jab at diversity hires, pronouns and woke culture all in the space of a minute. The attitude may just stem from a lack of local income, producing an entirely different ideology from those hailing from good old London town. We get a bit of a weird scene where the couple find an old VHS camera. Clunky old thing, innit? This scene would on the surface seem to make it look like the pair enjoy creating their own pornography, and them being filmmakers would naturally tie into this as well. In the midst of the fun, we cut to a shot of Davis's mum, Janet, wide awake and looking at a photograph of her dead husband. Like father, like son, there seems to be a connection between this idea of people enjoying the filming of private affairs. Charlie Brooker has talked about this episode in an interview with none other than the British Academy of Film and Television Arts. There's a fetish for the texture of old media and things, like old video and film and stuff is, is sort of part of it. So despite the fact that there's no tape, boo, the camera becomes a part of the pair's arousal, tying into the grander idea of why we find old murders from 20 to 30 years ago so appealing. Interesting also that they tie the idea of snuff films into this intrigue also. The Bergerac tapes the pair use were overwritten by the snuff films created by Davis's parents. The overwriting of the tapes by both documentary footage and snuff films comments on the replacement of old technology. Both streaming platforms and TV broadcasters are interested in pulling in as many people's eyes on screens as possible. Where crime reporting was generally left to the news in the past, all people had to watch outside of it were fictions. Streaming platforms seem more concerned with true crime, and that has exploded in popularity as a result. Peer, and by extension the audience, then learn about Ian Adair, the local murderer that apparently stopped all the tourists from visiting. We see it through a combination of stock footage and dramatic recreations. Both serve as nods to modern documentary filmmaking, as they are means by which filmmakers pad out their features. The use of old footage and new urges the viewer to take what they see more seriously. The way in which this episode ties fiction and documentary together is interesting, especially how it leads into the epilogue of the story story where the line between the two is truly blurred. You could even argue this footage shown early in the episode is foreshadowing of the documentary that would later be made. Despite the couple having this obsession with old filming tech, neither of them mention the more modern invention of Wi-Fi in this episode. The first thing I would have expected Pia to do when visiting somewhere new for more than a day is get some internet access. Apparently people have such good data plans these days that they don't even bother with it anymore. At 
first I thought I could shrug her indifference off with the belief that the episode might have been set in the past. All ideas about that went out the window though when we see Pia's phone screen sharply in focus as being the most 2023 phone screen you could possibly imagine. The reason this bothers me so much is that later in the episode Pia finds out the bitter truth about Janet. She can't reach Davis because she has no signal and might have been saved if she was just connected to the Wi-Fi. I've deliberately gone out of my way to do something a bit different as well with some of the stories because I wanted to sort of change it up a bit from not always being a show where someone's frowning at an iPhone. I suppose it wouldn't have mattered if she had made contact with him, but it just makes Pia seem kind of stupid in this moment, which seems inconsistent with the intelligence she displays throughout the rest of the episode. Then again, maybe we're not meant to like her. Regardless of what Janet did in the past, Pia is pretty rude about her. I do not want to think about your mom getting wet over some dude's butt. She wouldn't even eat her potato dauphin was. So good, thank you. Did you not like the dolphin was? Uh, I just try to limit my carbs. When the pair are pitching to the historic channel, she lies to the producer. What about the house itself and the dungeon? It's still there. And you have access to that? Yes. Absolutely. Showing that she will do anything to get her idea greenlit. Also, when Pia proposes they make a documentary about Ian Adair, she does it with the intention of making her boyfriend's trauma mass appeal. If you don't want to make it, I will. But maybe this is more a reflection of the pair's relationship than anything else. Davis's reluctance to begin on this very personal project may have more to do with his ego and having an inability to relinquish power over his film projects. He mistakenly claims that it's his film project at the start. We got to head on to a to shoot uh, my film. Our, our film. <laughs> and also claims ownership over the film course they were on. Uh, this is Pia. She was on my film course as well. Oh! Oh, your course was it? No. All right, you know what? Let's entertain the possibility that Davis had more nefarious reasons for making the film. I initially found it pretty strange that Davis would tell this story about Ian Adair with such a dramatic fervor. So that crawling back to his car. Calls for back at went from inside the house. And nothing. Considering he believes that Adair murdered his father. Ian Adair shot my dad. He died, Pierre. He fing died. That's real. That's not fing content. But he does also speak about his dad dying as something that doesn't really affect him emotionally. I was eight when he died, so most of my life he's just been a few photographs. The whole place was a lot quieter from then on. Then again, as Stuart says, I haven't got your storytelling instincts, you tell it. So this might just be a personality trait. At the same time, I can't help but think about the trailer for Lock Henry we see at the end, where we see Davis breaking down on camera. We never actually see his true reaction to the news that his parents were murderers, or or him discovering his dead mother. The only real reaction we see from him is during the epilogue, so let's just briefly put a pin in that train of thought and rewind before I get ahead of myself. I find the middle section of this episode to be kind of boring, really. It's filled with cringy interactions between the trio as they make the film, then proceeding to crash the van, all of them getting off very lightly. At first I thought they'd crashed into Stuart's father because we'd see him in the hospital, but then I remembered he had a little tumble earlier in the episode. This left me wondering, what happened to the driver they crashed into? And why don't they care? Then we have the whole Pia running away from Janet situation. Points can definitely be awarded to the fact she dies and her body floats down the river, which just happens to be where Janet and Kenneth threw all their victims when they were done with them. At the same time, I couldn't help but wonder how it failed to escape Janet's attention that at least one of her precious VHS tapes had gone missing. Later, she also failed to recognize the sounds of drilling, music, and screaming from the snuff film she herself starred in as she came up the stairs to tell Pia, dinner's ready. And I'm sorry, but her outburst. <laughs> was funnier than anything that came out of Podrick's mouth in the entire episode. It has to be said that Janet's death scene leading into the Lock Henry Streamberry trailer is the peak intrigue for this episode, mainly in the attempt to understand what Janet did and why she did it. Firstly, let's discuss the intent behind creating snuff films. I ended up wondering why a criminal would leave such damning evidence of their crimes unless they wanted people to see them. This definitely seems to be a more 
modern issue, examples include terrorists and school shooters putting themselves on the internet committing atrocities, either live or pre-recorded. This reasoning is my only means of understanding why Janet would leave all the tapes of her victims for Davis to find. Even the fact that she wears the mask in her final scene adds a layer of performativity to her death. The production of the Lock Henry documentary series gives Janet and Kenneth their very wish, whilst also providing job security for their son and a much needed financial boost to the town that they lived in. Now, if that isn't an ethical head scratcher, I don't know what is. Let's return to the epilogue of this episode. It was interesting seeing all the metalhead references in the news. This robot dog being unleashed in London was the result of Michael Smart, the conservative candidate that would make an appearance in the episode Demon 79. When the party's over, Davis is sat in his hotel room, left only with the BAFTA award that kept him company. It's almost like a reflection of him, both cold to represent the torn emotional state he finds himself in, whilst also being showered in gold. At the same time, I feel that the episode rushed to its conclusion somewhat. The episode seems to portray the film industry in a rather muddled way. On the one hand, its producers can be cold-hearted and thirsty for clout, on the other, Look how fun filmmaking is, guys. Look at this montage we made. I can't simply slate Charlie Brooker for fighting the good fight from within the industry itself, though. He seems to have hit the nail on the head once again when it comes to predictive accuracy of present and future events. The most recent activity of strikes coming from the Screen Actors Guild and Writers Guild of America are a result of streaming services not paying out residuals, aka being tight-fisted, and a concern for artificial intelligence threatening job security. I feel it was rather the hermit-like of me not to integrate that concern into my Joan is Awful review, so consider this a little footnote for not mentioning it in the last video. Perhaps the conclusion would have benefited from Davis seeing the tourism his documentary had generated. Having him see how messed up it is that people are wearing replicas of the mask his mother wore might have made his closing reaction hit a little harder. Unlike an episode like White Bear, the episode doesn't drive home the point very hard, and instead we are left to dwell on how lonely Davies has become in spite of his newfound fame. Maybe that's a good thing. It obviously keeps Lock Henry unique as a Black Mirror episode, but it makes you also wonder if he had more nefarious reasons for going along with the production and promotion of the Lock Henry documentary aside from helping out his hometown for a little while. The other thing we're left to dwell on is whether the reverence of murderers sets a good example or not. Is the media, streaming services, and social media making crime almost inescapable in our everyday lives? We started this video talking about how pleasing on the eyes these shots of the Scottish countryside are. Charlie Brooker describes these production values as a means of hiding the rubbernecking that a documentary provides for us. There's a bigger artistic veneer that goes on now, I think, in true crime documentary making, where they look like Scandinavian art house movies. It's certainly one thing to mock Netflix for a second Black Mirror episode in a row, but I would argue that Netflix documentaries have become banal as a result of this style. They no longer hook me in the way that they once did. We also mentioned in the Joan is Awful analysis that the editing style during the scene when Salma Hayek first plays herself is reminiscent of a Netflix documentary. You find this editing style across the board when it comes to filming interviews in them, accompanied by the big sweeping drone shots and people putting on their lapel mics. Shit's demeaning. I feel like Black Mirror is trying to mock Netflix's derivative production manner, whilst also perpetuating that very stereotype with the way that this episode is filmed.